Greetings, Earthlings! Welcome back to 7th Street. Well, I'm not sure this won't shorten my life. I suggest you take a cold shower, darling. God, I am so bored. This COVID thing has like really messed up my summer, man. Like all the movies that I was like supposed to be in and make have been put on hold. The pandemic has just completely screwed me over. All right, let's watch some more Italian crap. The Wild Beasts. Well, there's a super generic title for a not so generic movie. You know, this is one of those deep cuts. It's an Italian creature feature, mother nature run amok movie that's way more impressive than it gets credit for. It was directed by Franco Prosperi, which shouldn't come as much of a surprise if you're familiar with his work. Franco doesn't have the largest list of credits, but he was the filmmaker behind the infamous Mondo Cane, which spawned an entire subgenre commonly referred to as Mondo film. The Wild Beasts is not a Mondo film by definition, but it does have some similar elements, what with the blurring the lines between real and fiction. Usually, this technique is achieved by A, placing actors in dangerous situations, and B, most importantly, on-screen animal violence and or death. What do you think of a headline like, Crazed Animals in Zoo? Oh! No, I do not condone animal violence. I'm not a monster. It's sad, but this was a common practice in Italian genre films at the time. And you gotta remember, there was no PETA in Italy, no real laws against this. And in any case, the Italians were not so great at respecting international laws anyhow. I don't want to spend too much time on this topic. It's not something that I agree with, but I certainly think that this movie deserves the right to exist in be seen. All we can do now as progressive human beings is acknowledge that this is wrong and make sure that things like this never happen again. No. Oh God, please help us. The movie opens really well, with credits crawling over scenes of a dingy major metropolitan city, running with dirty, polluted water, and littered with discarded syringes. Lots of diabetics in this city. This is something that Franco Prosperi does really well, as showcased in his shockumentary Mondo films. Prosperi has a way of putting the dark side of human nature to film, but this time, instead of it being primitive culture, Prosperi turns his lens to a supposed first world utopia. He turns his lens on us, which is interesting. The man has made a living gawking at third world countries and depicting them as backward and bizarre, but Prosperi appears to be insinuating that we are the ones who are in fact destroying the world. We sit around scoffing at others, all the while polluting the water and ourselves. The credits end with a quote that further drives this point home. Hey, that's what we feed the mice with. Of mice and men. As far as messages go, this is the end of it. The social commentary doesn't live much past the opening credits, and there's very little in the way of lessons. The Wild Beast knows exactly what it is from this point on. A goofy, nature run amok film with lots of violence and gore. The movie wastes no time getting off to the races, establishing that somehow PCP has made its way into the local water supply. It's never really explained how this happened, which is fine by me, I suppose. I guess it really doesn't matter. Like I said, the movie knows exactly what it's trying to do, and what it isn't trying to do. And it isn't a movie that's heavy on plot. Once the animals at the local zoo start tripping out on PCP, the movie is pretty much just told in segments. What's that? PCP. Incredible. It's dynamite. It's a drug. They call it angel dust. Peace powder, zombie dust. Also jet fuel and busy bee. A thousandth of a gram of it is enough for a trip. Sounds wild. They add it to tobacco and smoke it. Yeah, you can smoke it, sniff it, shoot it, eat it, and drink it also. We 
We are then introduced to a young girl going off to dance school, and I won't show this scene, but in one of the most bizarre, unnecessary shots in cinema history, we see an 11-year-old girl changing her shirt. It's so strange and uncomfortable that to this day, I wonder if it's okay that I have this movie on my shelf. I'm not really sure why this is here and what Franco Prosperi was thinking. This is the part where usually I say, I'm Chris Hansen with Daytime yeah, yeah, NBC. Yeah. Right. So the little girl runs off to dance school. Meanwhile, a blind man seeing eye dog drinks some water and then rips his freaking throat out. <laughs> So yeah, this is where the movie gets really good. The animals start tripping hard. I mean, they're having a little bit of freak out, man. I mean, you really should have a sober buddy around when you mess with psychedelics. Our first victims are a couple getting busy in the back seat of a car underneath a dirty bridge. Typical horror movie trope, I love it. When they are suddenly attacked by a mischief of sewer rats that proceed to eat the couple alive, which is my personal worst nightmare. The only thing worse than being eaten alive by one big thing is being eaten alive by a bunch of small things. <laughs> Fun fact, apparently the rats that they used in this scene were actually white lab rats that a production assistant painted black. Boy, that's not a very fun fact. It's more sad, actually. Firefighters then show up to hose off the rats, but to no avail. So the military shows up with freaking flamethrowers and burns the rats alive. This is one of those scenes that usually makes people squirm because it feels so real, and that's probably because it is. The gacked out zoo animals continue to rampage through the city. One of the best scenes involves a herd of elephants taking over an airport runway. This visual is just crazy. It's amazing that they were able to pull this off. Apparently during the filming of this scene, one of the elephants stepped on Franco Prosperi's foot and broke it. Now there's a fun fact. Full throttle. Don't land. Elephants. Flaps 20. But we're going too slow, Captain. We'll stall. Try landing. I can't. It it's too short. <laughs> Chant, try landing. We're stalling. It's too short. Maximum revs. Come on. Baby. I've got full throttle, but number four's not responding. Across town, the tiger from the beginning starts to stalk the subway tunnels and making dinner of the commuters. Would you look at that? This guy is actually interacting with a real tiger. This movie is madness. How did no one die during the making of this? Apparently, this tiger actually got loose during the filming of this scene and hid in a subway bathroom. This subway scene is genuinely tense. It's probably the best scene in the movie. There's something out there trying to get in! Ah! It's a tiger! Ah! Ah! Meanwhile, at the dance school, I holy shit! This is a real live polar bear in the same shot with children! How did they possibly get away with this? I mean, I'm assuming that the bear is pretty heavily sedated, but still, that thing is up and moving just a few feet from these kids. That's so risky! So after outrunning the bear, we watch a bunch of dance school kids have a drink of, uh, oh shit. Anyhow, this last part of the movie plays out like a race against time as Rupert and Laura hurry to the dance school to rescue Susie. When they arrive, Rupert notices the polar bear from the zoo. How are you, old man? Be careful. I'll get a gun. No, no, he's okay. Look, I, I get it. You think that you're friends with these animals, but they're hopped up on PCP right now. I don't care how well you think you know them. Big Lurch killed and ate one of his roommates because he smoked too much PCP, and I guarantee he had more of a personal relationship with that person than you did with this polar bear. Yes, that was a Big Lurch reference. That's my attempt to appeal to a wider audience by, you know, 
referencing an obscure horrorcore rapper. Be good now. Come on. So the bear almost takes Rupert's head off, not just in the movie, but in real life. He almost gets decapitated here. The two doctors then run up the stairs to the dance classroom and, uh... <laughs> this movie is freaking crazy, dude. It's a romp in every sense of the word. So many of these win animals attack movies are disappointing. The Wild Beasts is one of the few that delivers. Franco wastes little time on plot, character development, and good taste, and just gets right into the action. Mark my words, this one is well worth seeing. The first time that I saw The Wild Beasts was actually on a VHS tape. It was released to Vestron Video back in the 80s, and I saw a trailer for it at the end of my VHS copy of Scream Time. I went to the local Movie Madness store here in Portland, Oregon, and I saw that they had a VHS copy, so I rented The Wild Beasts and actually got a VHS rip onto a DVD that I've had for a long time. But it was recently released by Severin to Blu-ray, so uh, make sure that you guys pick up a copy of that, watch it, and reference this film. All these new machines, TV monitors, little buttons, levers, flashing lights, dials, automation they call it. I call it bullshit. It just keeps people out of work. 